Matthew Phelps, co-author of the Turning to God's Word Bible study, You Shall Have No Other Gods, the book of Exodus. Today we'll be talking about lesson 19 of our study, which covers the book of Exodus, chapter 23, verse 20, to chapter 24, verse 18. This lesson is kind of third in a series of... We had the Ten Commandments, we had other small t tradition rules uh, that all that were all part of a message from God to his people, paving the way for, if you remember, they're at the base of the mountain. Uh, and we're in the midst of uh, forming and formalizing a relationship between God and his people. Uh, he's no longer going to be just the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Um, we're working on him becoming the God of these people. Um, and these rules are a part of that. Um, and a bigger part of that is the covenant, um, which we'll talk about in this lesson. Um, there are a few things here. First, we delve into what's it going to look like, right? So you become, I'm your God, you become my people. What's that going to look like, right? Okay, so we're going to leave the mountain. What next, right? If you enter into this deal, then what next? Um, well, then you're going to be led in by an angel into this paradise, Right? And over time, the paradise will expand, and I'll go before you, and I'll drive out all these other people, and, you know, nobody will be sick anymore. And, like, it goes from, like, possibly actionable, yeah, this could happen, to this seems too good to be true. Um, and I don't remember when that ever happened in human history. Um, and that's important, right? It, that's very important because the covenant exists on two levels. Um, it exists on the idealized version of the covenant that only happens, you know, if the people succeed at it, um, is heaven on earth, very literally, like not just like metaphorically, but like very literally, the idealized version of the covenant brings about heaven on earth. And that's, by the way, still what we're trying to do. Um, and also what the new covenant is working toward, uh, just better. Um, so they don't get to that. We haven't yet either, but that's still where we're going. Um, but this covenant fascinatingly has layers to it. It has that top layer of this is the deepest and most profound meaning of this. And then it has like the backup plan layer, the plan B. The th There are still contained in this covenant things that will still happen whether you do a good job keeping it or not, right? Like the covenant basically creates like boundary conditions where the best case is if you do a great job living up to your side of it is heaven on earth. Um, and the worst case is still some variation of all of that coming to pass. You still get into the Holy Land, um, you still kind of chase out everybody before you. And then there's like this, you're oscillating, right? Back and forth between the strange of the covenant. You're like bouncing around uh, varying degrees of you keep bouncing off that bottom line, right? When you get to the like the bare minimum, worst possible place, God intervenes and says, no, you're meant to be doing this. And it's like, he just keeps trying to bounce them back up toward where they're trying to go, and they keep bouncing off of the bottom conditions of that. Um, it's important that the covenant contains those bounds, right? It limits 
the scope of who these people can be, both toward the best and toward the worst. And that's where, you know, sometimes, and I've done this myself, uh, we talk about covenant as like just a deal where if you give this, then you get that, right? Like if you follow all these laws that we laid out, then you inherit eternal life. But the covenant is laid out here isn't just that top condition, right? And it doesn't just apply to the destiny and fate of these people if they are serving God. It applies, they bind themselves to it and are bound to it. And it applies regardless, forever. Um, and they not keeping it doesn't get them out of it, right? It, they, they're never in a spot where they can just say, you know, God, now that we're settled in here, like, that was nice and all, but we pass now. We're done. Um, some people do, actually. Like, people drop out of the covenant, uh, and you get more of a remnant, but who are still bound to it. But it never goes away. Um, and it doesn't have to be perfectly kept to be lived. That matters tremendously to us. Because the same is true with even more leniency, right? We have, we also have boundary conditions within our covenant, right? The ideal, super holy, we're all doing it right version also brings about heaven on earth. Um, that, that part has never changed. Um, and it's also true that God is going to work to course correct us back into place. And there are certain rules and guardrails that will keep us from going too far astray, such as the infallibility of the magisterium, right? We still have conditions in place where God is guaranteeing you entered into this covenant with me. I'm going to guarantee the overall direction and trajectory of you as my people. I'm not going to guarantee specifically and impose and force on you that you do specific things at specific times. But you've entered this covenant and that leads us together that way, right? Generally that way. And I'm going to make sure via the covenant that you are going generally that way. And I'm going to intervene to make sure that you're still going, you know, generally east right? Like if you, you're not going to start going west, right? You might go northeast, you might go southeast, you might go, you're, you're still going kind of generally east, right? And I'll bounce you around and keep you generally headed the direction you're supposed to go, right? Um, I think that's an, in, an, in, an interesting and a useful way to think about covenants is they set a general direction and some boundary conditions around that. Um, and that much is binding and you're not escaping that. And the best state is life and, you know, heaven and earth. And then there are still myriad conditions within the covenant where you die, right? You sin, you die. Right? There's the destiny of the people, and there's your individual destiny, and the two are different, right? This is like, as a people, as an individual, the old rules apply, right? If you sin, you die. If you don't sin, you don't die. Um, and that's your individual fate. This is the, like, corporate group fate of the people, and that's more complicated because one person can do great and the people can still be headed like due south, right? Um, and the one person can still be kind of fine and the fate of the people is still problematic, right? So you have, we're moving from only having relationship between God and individuals to relationship between God and a people. So this doesn't change the shape and character of how individuals relate to God or the covenant in place to deal with that, right? You sin, you die. You don't sin, you don't die. That's still there and that's still primary and foundational. Um, and you still, by observing the best case of that covenant, still get to heaven, if not heaven on earth, to heaven. And you veer out of bounds there and not. Um, 
there are fewer guardrails. Uh, the personal one is just the personal one. But for the people to get everyone together moving in one direction, there's another thing here that happens that's not God relating in, to an individual, but God re relating to a people. And that covenant sets these boundaries. And he's going to make sure, for his part, he's going to make sure they're headed in generally the right direction and course correct. And for that part, and for their part, that means they're never allowed to go out of bounds um, entirely. And the corrections are not pleasant. Um, and like, you bind, they bind themselves to it and they're bound. Uh, it's, it, it is a thing that happens. So that is what we're laying the framework for or the foundation for executing. And we kind of do here. Uh, although it happens sort of, it's reaffirmed not too long later. So it kind of happens twice, but it happens here. Uh, so this is not a small deal uh, in that regard. And we'll talk about some of the, you know, the details of how that works when we get into it. There are some cool things that happen, including some people actually seeing God uh, and what actually makes the covenant what it is and how does all this work. We'll get into through the lesson. But the big idea is one of covenant. So God's going to send an angel before them that's going to bring the people to the place which I have prepared. I don't usually use air quotes, but that's a very important phrase to come back to here in just a little bit. Uh, listen to him, don't rebel against him. Uh, he will pardon your transgression for my name is in him. Uh, And you know, if you listen to him, then I'll be an enemy to your enemy, an adversary to your adversary. So I'll be on your team. Um, what's the deal with this angel? Uh, word angel means messenger. Uh, we might or might not be mean like six winged, like 12 eyed. You know, the angels is actually visualized in the Bible don't look like the halo, two wings. Uh, cute little children things that we uh, that we see in popular art. Uh, they look horrifying uh, and glorious. Uh, we don't necessarily mean that transcendental being, right? Uh, we could mean we could mean messenger. The, the word is the same thing. Uh, so there is a question of what do we mean? Uh, and there's a question of what happened. Uh, this is where that idea of covenant is so important because I think what's being described here is that top boundary condition, right? This is your ideal scenario. This is your, your heavenward state uh, of everything going well, right? Um, and God sends a messenger that leads you to the place which I have prepared heavenward. Um, and, you know, his name is in him. Like, Jesus gets us pretty close to this, right? But nobody, if we follow, um, but nobody before that really gets us there, right? The people make it to the Holy Land, but they don't have a messenger from God to lead them there. So that's not what this is pointing toward. Um, it seems like it, because that's where they're about to go. And, you know, we know the history and we read into it, but then the number one condition doesn't happen of this angel being around to lead them. So the thing that happens isn't the thing that God was promising. So that still has to happen after the people get to the Holy Land. Um, so that's Jesus, right? Um, that's especially when you get to, for my name is in him, right? Like, uh, especially that preposition in is kind of tricky with that one. Because uh, what is God's name? We've talked about it a lot, right? Like, it's his, his identity, right? Like, yeah, this isn't, this is a, this is a big deal thing that shows us 
we're starting this from what does the ideal everyone does their part you as a people do your part well and this covenant leads you to where it has the power to lead you right it this covenant has the power to lead you as a people to heaven you could go there with this covenant that i'm going to lay out or you could go some other way uh, and just kind of inch your way toward heaven while you go a whole lot of other places along the way um, such as hypothetically having to wander for 40 years in the desert uh, before you get not that many miles to the promised land right is it's just a perfect and very intentional image of that right like that is this people's fate and it's not toward the promised land it's toward heaven right you could just go there it's right there it's so easy um, you could get there in like a month uh, and it takes 40 years right that is us right the covenant gives us the ability to enter into heaven and we go everywhere else and we wander 40 years and by that I mean like between this moment in time and now and continuing onward we just yeah we try whatever else and, and make a journey that could be very straight and very short into something that is very long. Uh, so I think here we're seeing, as we should when we're laying out the covenant, we're seeing the short way, right? This is the short way we're going to talk about. And then what we're going to do is the long way. This again has a couple of readings, right? There's especially with the way the word the words shall and will come into play right there's and i've always previously i've often always read things like this as like with an implied if right like okay here's the covenant and you know if you then i will right if you x then i will y right um and that's kind of true but it's kind of no i shall do this but if it hasn't happened yet it just means that we haven't gotten here yet right like the, cl the clear example from here that indicates beyond a shadow of a doubt we haven't done this yet um and i will take sickness away from the midst of you um we haven't done that yet I think I'm pretty safe in saying we haven't done that yet. Um, we, by keeping the cleanliness laws, whatever, maybe they weren't as sickly or as sick when they got to the Holy Land, but that's a pretty extreme promise, right? Like that's like heaven and earth kind of stuff. Um, and everybody, all of your enemies are not by you and you have peace and prosperity and no sickness um, and food and everything is like this is heaven on earth stuff right um, this isn't and it's not an if it's a will right like I will I shall um, this is again that this is showing us the direction that the covenant is pointing um, it's going to go this way uh, and you're going to go this way. You might, again, not go there by a straight line, but if if you enter into this covenant with me, then this is where you were going. Um, but you personally might not get there, depending on how good of a job you do with your individual parts of it. But that is what you as a people are committing yourselves to, uh, which is, um, it's a big deal, right? This is the what's in it for you, right? It's been, here are all these rules, and then here's what that gets you. Um, and the, the two are interlinked, right? Like, there is the implication that you do all the rules and this heaven on earth state happens. You can't have 
the heaven on earth state if you're not doing all the rules, right? Like, imagine you're breaking the first commandment and you're trying to live in peace without sickness and God taking care of all of your problems. And you're, you know, you're having lots of other gods before him, right? Like, it's out of balance, right? It's only, like, the rules are a part of the, the heaven on earth thing, right? They're a, a condition for it. It's not that God is trying to be, to either bribe the people or to be a hard ass and to punish them. It's none of that at all. It's you can't have heaven on earth without relationship with God, right? And you can't have relationship with God without keeping the commandments. You can't. Uh, we, we spent a whole way too long amount of time on that uh, in that video, uh, which, yeah, this one's getting there too. Anyway, uh, it's a big deal, right? Like the, the two go hand in hand, but it's because the things that the rules set up have to exist for the, the good road to happen, right? For the good ending here. Um, and any divergence on the rules and you stray from the path, right? You, you break a rule and you veer directionally away from where the covenant path is trying to lead the people. Anyone does, right? And so it also because it's as a people, you don't get to, like, I could be perfectly doing my part and my neighbor could be stealing from someone or coveting things or uh, not keeping the Sabbath. A and all of a sudden, even though I'm doing my part, we still have that weight of my neighbor dragging down the direction of the people. Um, this is a, an impossible thing. Like, it's impossible for one person to keep the covenant other than Jesus, right? Um, how do all the people keep the covenant. That is, by the way, the problem Christianity is still working to solve, right? Uh, and we have the tools with Christianity to do this, but we still need to do it. Uh, how do all the people keep the covenant? And when all the people don't, then that direction that we're pointing toward starts, again, starts to shift. The, the rules enable God to deliver on the promise of uh, heaven and earth. What he wants to give us is not all these rules. What he wants to give us is the direction he's trying to lead us into. We can't go there without all these rules. The rules enable us to receive what God wants to give us. Um, the two are, but the, the two are very linked. But the rules are there to enable us to receive the gift that God is trying to give us. It's worth noting that these Hivites, Canaanites, Hittites, all these people represent more than people, right? This is, they represent enemies and oppressors more than human beings in this context, right? Um, they happen to, in the immediate historical context here, be represented by human beings, right? They are also human beings. You have God's people and you have the people who currently are inhabiting the land that God is going to give to his people who are not going to be thrilled by that idea. Um, and, are, and you have the understandable uh, conflict that that is going to breed, uh, for sure. Um, and then you're going to have those people spend a very long time being very sore at, um, at God's people. Um, imagine there being contention over ownership of the Holy Land. That's not a thing that could ever persist for thousands of years. Um, but it, it goes all the way back, right? And there's the idea that when... And as the covenant is per is perfectly kept, then the Holy Land will be secured from all of these enemies round about. 
um, and that God will do that, right? He'll just kind of, terror will go before him and they'll just sort of like leave. Um, God will drive them out uh, and it'll take some time. It's, <laughs> what what is that thing is it in the Psalms that, a thousand years is like a day for God. So when God says it's not going to happen right away, maybe he really, really means it. Uh, and if he says it's going to take a few years, maybe, or maybe he means a very, very long time. Uh, and maybe we, this is a little out there and I'm not sure I think or even agree with this. Uh, but you could make a case that maybe we don't have peace in the Holy Land until people... Uh, or keeping the covenant, which is not the way that they seem to be trying to do it right now. Um, and there's conflict. Um, maybe we could try keeping the covenant. That would be maybe better than guns and bombs. Um, but, um, you know, and it hasn't been tried yet. So um, it, it might be, <laughs> if you look at the history of these people, it's really the one thing they haven't tried. Maybe they should. Um, us too, though, right? Like, uh, this is not to bash... Uh, the Jews in the Holy Land, right? We were, were involved in this covenant, uh, right? Like the end state of their covenant, it becomes our covenant and the end state is the same, right? We're all on the same path. Um, and like, we probably need to get our part of it right also for where this is, like, yeah, this is, this is not a Jew and Christian thing. This is a people of God thing. And maybe we should get on actually trying to be the people of God. Um, and then, you know, God could get rid of the conflict that is not just in the Holy Land. Uh, the conflict has been everywhere forever because we haven't tried, you know, not doing that, um, which would be which would be a, a good thing to try sometime. Um, so, yeah, anyway, uh, peace from conflict and enemies is another one of those things that is on the direction that this covenant is leading. This is really more of the same. Again, the boundaries are both physical and not, and the not are way more important. Uh, and by the way, in case you missed it, that first commandment is like, is a good is a good thing to keep like the the things that are repeated a lot right first commandment sabbath some of these really foundational things they're repeated a lot because they're important and they're hard to do right like all rag on people for not doing in the in the text for not doing these things. But if I look at my own life and I look at, I'm not doing those things, right? Like just those two, right? Like you could be a saint by doing those two things, right? That commandment and that religion, the first commandment and the first religious practice, do those two things and you're there, right? Like, and everything else is elaboration on how to do that. Um, it's repeated a lot because it's the foundational stuff that everything builds on uh, and helps to do better. But just just do that, right? Um, you shall have no other gods before me and remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy, whatever that means, and, and you're home. You've got it. Good job. Um, they're repeated because they're important. Aaron and a couple other named guys and 70 of the elders are going to go part way up the mountain, but Moses alone uh, is going to come near to the Lord. Uh, we'll get to that. Uh, and so Moses goes, you know, that seems to be also a part of this covenant, right? Like, because it's the last thing before Moses goes and tells all the people what's going to happen. Um, so we probably ought to think that that is also something that has those two readings, uh, those the two versions where not Moses 
goes into the presence of God for real, Jesus, um, and everybody else with him gets to go up the mountain, but they're not quite in the presence of God, but they're, you know, up the mountain uh, and close, and those are, you know, the elders of the people. Uh, like, there's a fulfillment of that beyond what's going to happen here as well. But we're also coming back down into the practical now, out of the covenant, and we get to, we get to talk a lot more practically, which uh, will be good as well. Um, so they, Moses comes down and presumably relays the last four or five chapters worth of text to all of the people uh, who's, who hear the, you'll settle in the land and there won't be sickness and you'll have food and your enemies won't bother you and I'll give you this place to live and say, yep, great, sign me up. What was that first part again? Doesn't matter, sign me up. I could use some land. Um, that's a little cynical, but we've been going through, not too much, we've been going through this for how long? How many of you all hearing this think that you could commit to following the terms of the covenant is laid out here. Uh, the problem with this covenant, uh, in fact, is that it's impossible to keep, um, except for, you know, God himself. Um, it, and even then, God can't keep it for all the people. He changes, he gives us another route uh, when he keeps it, and that's the new covenant. It's why we need another one right? Because we can't do this one. Um, how much do you think the people were all really considering and weighing their ability to carry out their end of this? Or were even that serious about trying to? We'll see how that works. I'm sure they'll get it really good. I'm sure they'll do a really good job like right away and for a while. Um, and it'll only be like way later that they start to struggle uh, and they're, they're initially entirely bought in and on board, right? Like, I'm, I'm sure I'm making too much of that. And they'll, they'll initially be great. Um, we'll see what happens. But anyway, they commit, right? Like, they say, yes, we're in. And God takes that as, you said it, I'm, I'm writing it, down. like, sealed, signed, sealed, and delivered, right? Like, you're, okay, we're doing this. Like, you may not have adequately considered that what you're what you're accepting here but you were told and you accepted and it bought and it is binding uh, so congratulations on being joined to the covenant let's see how that works but again i'm sure it'll all go very smoothly uh we'll, we'll, we'll get to that it'll be it'll be fine i'm sure first thing moses does is okay you all agreed to it now i can bother writing it all down um so that you know note that the writing of it it's not like it was written and signed right like later this people becomes very legalistic and like the the letter and the writing of the law and all that becomes like the thing it is the law before it's written Right? It is orally communicated from God to Moses, who then repeats it to the people, and everybody says, okay. And at that point, Moses thinks, you know, it might be a good idea. If, if we're doing this, it might be a good idea to write it down. Uh, but the writing is secondary, right? The, the word spoken from God to Moses and from Moses to the people is the thing that binds. Um, that spoken word of God. Um, and the written part is just helpful aid, right? You could think of our own Bible the same way, right? The spoken living word of God is the powerful, important thing that binds. And the thing that comes to us in book form is a helpful aid to that. Uh, but the book itself and the, the print on the pages isn't what makes it holy and sacred. It's the word of God that is spoken and alive that makes it powerful. And then it's very, very helpful for us that it's written down and we can read it um, and study it. Um, so first thing Moses does is he writes it all down. Um, and then 
uh, we're going to have some liturgy. We have a lot of liturgy in the book of Exodus, um, and it's all very important. So what do we need? We need an altar. We need 12 pillars because now we're going to be, you know, we're really doing this thing where we're going to have a people. Uh, and it's going to be 12 and 1, 12 tribes. Um, so we're going to symbolize all of that. Uh, and we're going to get it set. And then we are, note, the we sacrifice a bunch of animals as peace offerings. That's not part of the liturgy that we're about to do. Um, the blood is needed. The sacrifice is not. He builds the altar. He has the altar. It doesn't even seem like these sacrifices happen on that altar. Huh? We're going to end up with here having a covenant that involves an altar and blood, but no sacrifice. And that's as part of this one rite. And that's going to what be what binds these people to God through the blood. That sounds familiar. Uh, we're recording this on a Sunday. That sounds like something that, you know, seems vaguely recently familiar to me. Uh, where could we have an altar where no sacrifice is actually altered and offered in terms of something being killed, where blood binds the people to God? I wonder where that might happen. Mass. Happens at Mass. Um, we'll get there, right? Like, uh, so we're getting all the parts in place. The thing from these sacrifices that matters isn't the ritual sacrifice. It's the blood. Now we get to the liturgy. Uh, again, the sacrifice is done in advance. Moses has this blood. Uh, half of it was already thrown on the altar. Uh, and then we've got half of our blood in bases. Then what do we do? We read the words that presumably are the ones Moses already wrote down. Where do we do that? Mass, it's the mass, right? Like It's the mass. Um, first part, liturgy of the word. You read and talk about the word of God. What does Moses do here? He reads the word and presumably lectures them about it for a while. Uh, he seems like one who liked to talk based on how this is going, and they needed to hear it. Uh, so first part, word. Second part, they respond. Uh, again, they reaffirm, we're, we are, we agree, uh, we are, we are doing this. Amen, if you will. So let it be so, right? Like some kind of great ascent on behalf of the people. I wonder where we do that. Uh, but yes, they're in. They're on board. They reaffirm this is a thing that we want. We agree. Uh, and then uh, Moses throws the blood on the people uh, and it binds the covenant. Uh, the covenant is bound in blood. Why? Because blood is life. Right, going all the way back to uh, Noah after the flood, we see in the Bible that the lifeblood of something is considered sacred and belonging only to God. Um, it represents life. Um, admittedly, we just killed animals to get it, but it represents life. So there is the life of these people is being bound in and to this covenant um, through the blood um, so that if they step outside the covenant they will die but of course they're dead anyway and they don't know it right they're already mortal so the thing that it can offer is life not death um, and that's so the blood symbolizes both life and death but most importantly it it more than symbolizes it is life that is offered in the terms of the covenant that has been accepted, uh, a way out of death. Um, that's our mass, right? Like we are rebinding ourselves to the covenant every time we go to mass, right? We're rehearing the word of God and saying, yep, I'm gonna, I'll do that. Um, 
we're represented with the new covenant and our place in it and are given a chance to say, yep, I am in. And then we are rebound to that covenant over and over and re-offered life uh, through blood uh, poured out in sacrifice. Um, this is the first really clearly this form. It's in other forms previously a little bit, such as the offering of Melchizedek. But this is the first one that really resembles the form that we still today do. And the reason for that is this is the first liturgical rite that involves God's people as God's people. Like, so what we do now as God's people is what we did from the very first time there was God's people. The thing we do now daily is the same thing that created and continues to create a people as God's people. Um, it's non-negotiable and essential that that happen to make people into the people of God. We don't just go to Mass to hear whatever homily Father came up with while he was surfing the internet. Some of them are better than others, right? Like some of them are actually fantastic. Uh, but some of them are not so much, but it doesn't matter, right? We're there not for just for what Father is going to say or to say hi to our friends or to go to a pancake breakfast. Um, we're there to become the people of God in the blood of Christ. Um, and every time we go to Mass, that happens. Um, it's a big deal. In the Mass, there are the apoclesis, the calling upon of the Holy Spirit happens twice. It happens once on the bread and wine and it happens once on the people. Um, and they're the same in character, right? Both become Christ. Um, it's, it's a huge deal. And this is the first time that it happens. So then Moses and the elders go up and they see God and they don't die. The whole deal has been made that there that if you see God, you'll die. And by every account that's true. Except here. Um uh, why now do they get to see God? Um They've just entered into the covenant. They've had no time to break it yet. Um, they are, this is what the covenant does. It allows you to enter into the presence of God safely. Um, they're going to blow that real quick. But right now, they are God's people and they're able to cross that threshold that is the base of the mountain and go up. Before they entered the covenant, they were all just outside, down outside the mountain, right? And that was correct for them. Um, they, they were mortally afraid of taking that one step up onto the mountain. And it was heavily implied that they were right to be, right? Like that if they got closer to God or saw God, they would die. What has changed is them, right? The mountain is the same they have changed through the covenant that they have entered. They are able to climb the mountain and to look at God. Again, mass, right? Like this thing still happens and it still does this, right? It still allows us to see God um, and to safely find passage up God's mountain into heaven and to see and to stand into the present and stand in the presence of God. It's safely um, or at all. Um, it's an easy thing to read over in the scriptures and a 
tremendously important thing that happens that a whole bunch of Israelites are able to go up and see the presence of God um, or to see God. Nothing like that happens again until everybody sees Jesus. But nothing like that with just a bunch of people seeing God happens again. The reason it doesn't is because the covenant gets broken like immediately. Uh, so you have this very short window. Where Where is the other time where people are just chilling with God and it's no big deal? Um, it's right back at the beginning before the individual covenant is broken, right? You have Adam and Eve in individual personal covenant with God. Before that's broken, they can hang out in the garden with God and it's, and they're all good, right? Like, and then they break that and they are kicked out of the garden and individual people can no longer have that relationship with God until that's restored. Here, as a people, they enter into a covenant uh, with God. And as a people, they can go up the mountain and they can see God till they break it and then they can't anymore. Which, but right now, this is this is equal in importance to Adam and Eve in the garden. It and it takes up about this. It takes up even less of the Bible. It's a big deal that these people go up, and why they're able to see God. God calls Moses up the mountain to go up to wait. And he is going to give Moses tablets of stone with the law of the commandment written on it for them. So Moses already wrote now and all the things he told them. Uh, here is a reiteration in stone of the same thing written by God himself um, for the people and for their instruction. Again, this is what it looks like when things are good, right? We, we just entered covenant. Everything is great. God is going to carve in stone. This is what this is, what it looks like, how it works. Um, and so Moses waits and he's going to go up. And who is going to be, who's around to help him? Most importantly, who is it not? It is not Aaron. Um, or any priests. It is Joshua. Uh, for those not familiar with how like Hebrew and Aramaic and later Latin work, we've done very interesting things over time to the name of the guy that we call Jesus. Uh, he would not have been called Jesus. He would have been called Yeshua. Uh, his name was Joshua. Joshua and Jesus are the same name. Um, with a little bit of the language evolving over time through um, the Babylonian exile and back. And, you know, it shifted a little bit. But Jesus' name was effectively Joshua. Um, so when Moses goes up and the guy who is going up also with him is... In many ways, the figure of Joshua is more important than the figure of Moses because he's the one who comes after. And he, in some ways, better prefigures Christ than Moses does. Um, up to and including sharing the name. And also just being a much is made of Moses' ability to go up the mountain and to see God. And it's just like a given that, if, that Joshua can do it right? Like it's a big deal for Moses. And it's just like, yeah, sure. Joshua did that too. Um, and like right now it's fine because everybody can go up the mountain and like that includes Joshua, but we'll keep an eye on him a little bit. Um, but you know, if only two people ever go up the mountain and that's accurate, Moses and Joshua are the people who go up the mountain. Um, and one of them fails, and it's not Joshua. Uh, and one of them leads the people into the promised land. Um, 
and it's Joshua. Um, anyway, neat thing. Uh, but God's going to write the law down. They're going to wait around a little while and then they're going to go up to the very top and they're going to, and they're going to get that. Uh, they're going to get the law from God and they're going to encounter God more closely. Moses waits before being able to go up the mountain. Six days. And on the seventh day, God calls to Moses from the midst of the cloud. Um, and Moses goes up to meet God on the seventh day, uh, on the Sabbath day. You're waiting around, and on that seventh day, you get to, you're called into the presence of God. This is finally... There's so much made of what not to do, Sabbath rant again, inbound. It'll be faster this time. Uh, we're not, this is the first time we're not focusing on what we don't do on the Sabbath, right? Like this is what you do on the Sabbath, right? All the stuff you're not doing carves out and makes the space so that you can do the thing you are supposed to do. On the seventh day, you go up the mountain and you enter into the presence of God, which you can't do if you're doing all the stuff you do all the other days. So you're not, the absence of work and activity is not an end in and of itself. Um, if you focus on just not doing stuff, you're, you've missed the point too. It's, you're meant to be with God on the Sabbath. Um, and you know, if you can do chores around your house and you can be with God, then great, go for it, right? Like the goal, the end goal of the Sabbath is to spend the day being in the presence of God. The means to help you to achieve that goal is the rest from work and all of that stuff. Um, but of the two, the thing that matters is being with God. Uh, the rest from work and all of that is meant to help you do that. Um, and that's what Moses models here. Um, and then he's going to go up the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights, um, a period of purification, as we've seen, and something that and we'll see uh, later in this book, and we'll talk about it some then too. It's not days then, uh, it's years, but, and of course, it's when we do, it's how we do Lent as well. This is a number that comes up from time to time. Uh, Moses is going to go up and be with God for 40 days and 40 nights, and I'm sure the people will spend time product productively reading and studying that law that was written down and praying and devoting themselves to the new covenant that they have entered into. But we'll have to tune back in in the next lesson to see them diligently going about keeping the covenant. But Moses is going up on the mountain. This has been an overview of Lesson 19 of the Turning to God's Word Bible Study, You Shall Have No Other Gods, the Book of Exodus. For more information, consult our written study and visit us online at turningtogodsword.com.